Okay, welcome. We are going to look at the Apostle John today. And I want to give a special shout out as we get started to Sam Towns. He was the one that put together these slides and he helped me today in a live Zoom. But he also gave me gracious permission to share these with you on the internet uh, through my YouTube channel. But the reason we're looking at John is because we're going to go into a new series on the last days. And there's so many things that are happening. Uh, I wanted to show you how these things are connected to the messages of Jesus and how he said he's coming back. And if we look around us, um, we can see that. So I want to uh, start that with a look into John because John uh, lived during the time of Revelation. And much of the language within Revelation uh, has a lot to do with the persecutions and the strife that the early church was going through. So let's take a look at John. This is an overview of the apostle who wrote five books of the New Testament, including the book of Revelation, as we spoke of. So who was he? He's probably the youngest of the 12 apostles. There were 12 that hung around with him, with Jesus. Uh, he's one of three disciples that Jesus kept kind of close to him in his inner circle, uh, Peter, James, and John. And then John, he was a fisherman on the north end of the Sea of Galilee with his older brother James. They also worked with Peter and Andrew, his brother. Uh, Jesus gave John and his brother uh, a nickname, Sons of Thunder. That's kind of funny. We don't really know the exact reason. Uh, some theologians think it may have been because of their speech or their temperament. You can imagine uh, a fisherman's temperament probably is not uh, real, uh, you know, soft. So he may have been a little rough. I don't know. Uh, John authored more of the New Testament than any other disciple. There's 12 of them, and he has the most writings of them. But uh, you have Luke and Paul, who were followers of Christ. Christ came to Paul, and then Luke was uh, Paul's uh, right hand during many of the uh, portions of the missionary journey that he went on. They wrote more of the New Testament than John did, but John, as far as the apostles, was the most uh, written in the uh, New Testament. The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation are accredited to him. He's believed to have died in an old age or of an old age around 100 AD in Ephesus, Turkey, after being on Patmos Island as a prisoner of Rome. And the other disciples are believed to all have been martyred. So he was the only one that grew to an old age. And the early church was very thankful that he was with them because they were able to ask him a lot of questions uh, during his last days. And, you know, I can imagine sitting around John and and saying, hey, what was it like when Jesus came back from the grave? Or what was, tell me, so, tell us about his miracles. So John was an eyewitness, and you can read his gospel to learn more about that. So what was his life like before Jesus? Well, his brother, James, and Peter and Andrew, they were all fishermen in a business. And they were success, successful enough that they, they had uh, some help. You can see that in, in the book of Mark. John was the son of Zebedee, who was also a fisherman. So his father, Zebedee. Uh, he was a fisherman in Galilee, and John's mother's name was Salom. And some say that Salom was the sister of Jesus' mother. There was a Salom that was Jesus' mother. We don't know for certain, but Mary making him a possible cousin uh, to Jesus. So Salom and Mary possibly were sisters. And you can see some connections to this in some of these scriptures where Salom was at the cross and helped the ladies there when uh, Jesus was put in the tomb. But um, Sam wanted us to mention, imagine dropping everything and walking away from a successful business. And that's what John did when Jesus called him and said, you know, why don't you come and I will make you fishers of men? Well, John, his brother, Peter and Andrew, they dropped their nets, dropped their uh, lifestyle, and they came and followed Jesus uh, and listened to him as their teacher. And they were forever thankful that they did. Some special events that John saw. Here's three. Uh, though he was the youngest of the disciples, he was invited by the Lord to share the most incredible moments of his ministry. For example, Jesus took John with him when he raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead. So he was able to see that firsthand. Many people he told to get out of the room and let him just have a private moment to be able to uh, show these disciples. And they were able to see that. John was also one of the three who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain with Moses and Elijah, and he heard the voice of God, which declared, Jesus, this is the beloved Son of God. So John heard that, 
You know, he even speaks of that in his writings. He says, we heard God say that to him, that he was his son. That's an important uh, personal witness. With his dying breath, Jesus committed to John's care, his mother. He said, you know, this is a testimony to John's kindness. But he said, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. And uh, he was establishing a relationship. And John, from that point on, uh, took care of his own mother. So that's a pretty important person in Jesus's life that Jesus would have said that uh, in one of the seven recordings we have of what Jesus said on the cross. He said, John, take care of my mother. Pretty important. Now, John's life after Jesus, he went into Turkey. And we call it Asia Minor in the scripture, specifically Ephesus. And he vigorously applied himself to the circulation of Christianity, preaching the gospel where it had not been preached in some cases and confirming it where it had already been planted in some house churches established by Paul and others. So his ministry was in that local Ephesus region, and they invited him to come out and to speak. And uh, he established churches, but he also confirmed what Paul had been preaching throughout Paul's um Paul's letters, like Paul had a letter to the Ephes to Ephesus, and he had a Paul to uh, Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth, and and John went about in that region where he was and and confirmed those messages. Some churches founded by John were Smyrna, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. His chief place of residence was at Ephesus, where Saint Paul, well, we call him Paul. Uh, had founded a church and had appointed Timothy as its pastor. I'm, I'm sure Timothy was very thankful that John came and lived amongst the people in Ephesus. John became the last living apostle and had a great respect by the church of his day. It would have been very important to the church that John continued to help them uh, as the church was being, uh, as the church evolved into what it is today. So let's talk about persecutions of that day. And this is from the religious, the religious people persecuting. We're talking about the Jews that did not believe in Christ and also the people that believed they were Greek uh, religious zealots over their gods, Jupiter and and um, Apollos, uh, not Apollos, but um, Zeus. So there was a lot of religious activity that was against the early church. Here's a couple of examples here. You got... Uh, Peter and John were arrested by the religious. Stephen was arrested, stoned to death, striking a severe persecution. You can see that in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Saul, who was, uh, the Roman name was Paul, imprisons many Christians. So Saul was persecuting people at the first. Then they, when Paul became a Christian or a believer, uh, the Jews got a plot to kill him. Herod executed James uh, and imprisoned uh, Peter. And that would be uh, James, the uh, brother of John. So he lost his brother's life. Of course, he knew where his brother went, but I'm sure it was very uh, sad for him that his brother was uh, was murdered by uh, by Herod. Herod executes James and imprisons Peter. Peter was placed in jail. And, you know, we talk a lot about persecutions. Well, they definitely went through persecutions in the early church. Paul and Barnabas were driven out of Antioch. Jews and Gentiles attempt unsuccessfully to stone Paul and Barnabas. Jews stoned Paul nearly to death. And some believe that he did die, and he talks about a vision where he was able to see heaven during that time, but God sent him back, and he, you know, recovered from that stoning. Paul and Silas are flogged and imprisoned by Gentiles in Philippi. Paul and others are chased out of the successive towns, uh, so over and over, by the Jews. Paul goes to court. So he had to go to court over his faith. Worshippers of Artemis in Ephesus riot against Paul, his companions, Roman soldiers. So over and over and over, you see much persecution in the early days. Uh, this is during John's day of people that were strong believers. They wanted to squash the, uh, the, the gospel out, keep them from talking about it. Even the Rome, the government, got involved on trying to silence the Christians. Under Emperor Nero, who lived between 54 and 68 as the emperor there, uh, the persecutions took off with a new and mischievous superstition. That's what he called it. And as Suetonius described it, uh, Christians were blamed for the fire of AD 64 in Rome, according to Tacitus, which was a Roman historian, and further viewed by the high suspicion as a group that was degraded in shameful practices. You know, and 
you know, what were their practices? Well, they loved one another and they cared for each other, but they were calling them degraded and shameful, holding to a foreign and deadly superstition, which would be the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and certainly they evidenced antisocial tendencies to separate themselves from the Roman government. So these are writers in Rome, uh, Suetonius and Tacitus, that are writing about the early Christians and about how they were despicable people and how they were trying to uh, silence the Christians uh, for all of these tendencies, the antisocial, uh, believing the superstitions, shameful practices, the way they were. All right. Christians who refuse to recant and, and say we do not believe in Jesus anymore uh, by performing ceremonies to honor the gods of Rome, of Greek mythology, uh, would meet with severe penalties. And that's talking about citizens. Um, Roman citizens were exiled or condemned to a swift death by beheading. You know, hey, thankful that they were allowed to be killed by beheading. And this is how Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. Foreign-born residents, however, and lower classes were put to death by wild beasts as a public spectacle or for the entertainment uh, and example that if you don't obey the government, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, we know there are stories about Nero having Christians impaled on telephone pole, or excuse me, on poles and uh, greased up and then lit and burning uh, during the night to provide night lights or street lamps. For the people to walk in Rome, uh, we know that they had many uh, circus entertainment, so to speak, with animals. Animals coming in and and ripping them from being alive, ripping them to shreds. Uh, and for this persecution, um, you, you can see why John would have written uh, the way he did, talking about there's going to be difficult times. There's rough. Um, persecution that's going to take place. And and honestly, we have no clue what real persecution is like. We look at the things that the church is going through today and uh in like in America and we think, wow, we're really facing persecution. But the the truth is we've never seen persecution like what John would have witnessed in his day. Tertullian and Fox uh tell that while John was in Ephesus, Roman Emperor Domitian, known for intense persecution of Christians as well, Put John into a pot of boiling oil. That's what that's what they tell us. However, God restrained the heat and delivered him from dying. This is similar to the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace of Daniel. This may be a traditional fiction, so it may not be true. We're not certain of that. However, one part that we know is true. Uh, that is, it. Uh, if that part is not true, it was not sufficient to convince the emperor of Christianity or to reduce his fury, so he ordered John to be transported to the Isle of Patmos, and that is true. Uh, we know John went to that island, and here John was inspired by the Lord to pen the book of Revelation, revealing the state of the church and foretelling events that would soon take place in the future, ending with our deliverance. So we know for certain that John himself was persecuted, uh, at the very least, having to go to the Isle of Patmos and be imprisoned there. So what is Patmos? Well, it was a small, rocky, and barren place where many criminals of Rome were sent to serve out their prison terms in harsh conditions. Uh, there were mines on the island that the criminals were forced to work. John was sent to the island for the same reasons, because early Christians were considered a strange cult. By the way, we are still listed among the cultish because we have one, one person that we worship. Rather than accepting all gods, we preach against that. Uh, and who is known for causing trouble within the empire. And Patmos was right off of Ephesus. Uh, so as soon as he was released, he was eventually released. He was allowed to go back to Ephesus after uh, the emperor passed on and they went to another um, emperor. So on the death of the emperor Domitian, the next emperor repealed the terrible acts of his predecessors and John was allowed to go back to Ephesus. Of course, now he's a very, very old man and uh, not able to do as much travel. But he spent his last day sharing the gospel that he had heard from Jesus himself. And many people probably came to him, uh, if I could imagine uh, correctly. And uh, he was buried in the city of Ephesus at a church which was built in his honor. And he was nearly 100 years old when he died. And um, that that is very reliable historical sources that he did come from Patmos. And, and you know, we kind of wash over that a lot of times, thinking that that was, wasn't a very harsh treatment but for 
you know, a couple of years there, he was on patent. That would have been a very difficult uh, state for him to have to endure to be on an island where they're breaking rocks or slicing rocks and putting them in. And of course he would, uh, in large blocks so they could build buildings with it. And he was not uh, young, so he's not going to be able to do a whole lot. So I'm sure that as he got older and the the Romans saw how loved he was as a, a dearly uh, beloved grandfather, um, they eventually would have just said, you know, this guy's not able to do anything here. He's not going to do anybody any harm. Just let him go. So we we can kind of look at that as that would make sense that he was allowed to leave and go back to Ephesus and uh, be with the people there of the church. So let's talk about the people he was with. Under John's guidance, one of the followers of John was Polycarp. He lived between 69 and 155. John left him as the pastor of the Smyrna church. Polycarp was burned at the stake for his faith. So we know that Polycarp believed everything that John told him, that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. He was the first fruits of all of us that will resurrect as well. And uh, Polycarp, his writings uh, and quotations, he quoted from these many letters as the early church would take a letter, copy it, and then share it with the next church. And sometimes uh, people would have others copy those letters down. So Polycarp and Ignatius, uh, he was appointed to the church at Antioch by John. So these two, uh, in their writings, we see many of the quotations from the early books. Uh, that's one reason why we know that these books had surfaced prior to John's death because they received those books, they copied them, they quoted them, uh, the teachings that were in the in the uh, New Testament. So uh, if somebody tells you that the New Testament is not a book that was written in the first century, that it was written maybe three or four hundred um, A.D., that is, that is incorrect. Uh, Polycarp and Ignatius and Arrhenius, they all quoted from the books of the New Testament. So these books were being circulated prior to uh, 100. Later, Arrhenius said, I could tell you the place where the blessed Polycarp sat and preached to us the word of God, to hear him relate how he conversed with John and many others who had seen Jesus and the words he had heard from their mouth. So that was one of his testimonies that he talked about Polycarp, who had sat at the feet of John and the other people that had known Jesus in person. So it wouldn't just be John, it would be others that were in that day. So Arrhenius, he said, I could show you the spot where me and Polycarp met and talked about uh, Christ with John the Apostle. All right, so uh, next Sunday we're going to be uh, going back to church. We've been in quarantine for a while and been doing lessons completely online, but I want to encourage you to try to continue uh, finding these lessons online. We will uh, provide a Zoom link if you want to email me. Uh, the Zoom link will be available. I'll make sure my email is inside of the notes on this video, but uh, you can connect with us in a live format. I'll be showing that, but the next series is going to be a study of the last days. So I hope you'll join us and I appreciate you watching us today.